Hello and welcome. Wherever you are with God, wherever you think God is with you, it's good that you could join us. My name is Terry Clark and I'm the minister of Dean Church and of Lostock Church here in Bolton. In a moment, Becky will lead us in song and then Sandra McPherson, warden at Lostock Church, will bring us our Bible readings. But before any of that, let me pray for us. Risen Lord Jesus, through whom all things were created, by your Spirit, calm our anxieties. Help us to hear your voice very clearly. And may we respond to your word in faith and obedience. Amen. The reading today is taken from Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 and also Acts chapter 1 verses 1 to 11. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and service, servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent theologists, so that you may know the certainty of things that you have been taught. And from Acts, in my former book, Theologists, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John was baptised with water, 
Within a few days he will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and all in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I guess we learn over the years to be a little bit wary of statements that begin, apparently, or, well, I've heard that. Such statements are often the stuff of gossip or urban myth, and there's plenty of that around just now. When Luke was writing his Gospel account, he wasn't just writing what he'd heard about Jesus from someone whose great aunt had once lived on the same street as Mary Magdalene's hairdresser. He tells us that he's recording eyewitness accounts. The eyewitness testimony of the people who had actually been with Jesus, especially the Twelve Apostles, those who had witnessed the miracles heard the teaching, seen Jesus put to death, and then seen him alive again on that first Easter Sunday and over the next 40 days. Luke was one of the Apostle Paul's travelling companions. Paul tells us in his letter to the Colossians that Luke was a doctor. Luke certainly had an eye for detail, and a mind for accuracy. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, so both books in the first place to someone called Theophilus. Let's look at five things from Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 about how Luke's gospel account came into being. Firstly, Luke's account is based on historical events. Verse 1. The things that have been fulfilled among us. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, John, as well as Luke, record actual historical events. Jesus really did heal the centurion's servant. Luke chapter 7. Jesus really did calm the storm. Luke chapter 8. Jesus really was executed on the cross, Luke chapter 23. The risen Jesus really did appear to lots of people, Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. But more than this, what Jesus did was in fulfilment of the scriptures, the whole of the whole testament. All those prophecies about the coming Messiah, for instance, is like a big signpost pointing us to who Jesus is and to the trustworthiness of God. When God says that he's going to do something, then he does it. We can take God at his word. Jesus said that he would die for his people, taking the punishment for our sin in our place, and he did. He said that he would rise again on the third day, and he did. Real historical events fulfilling God's promises. Secondly, what we have here are eyewitness accounts, verse 2. Luke went around with his notebook interviewing these guys, interviewing Mary, the mother of Jesus, interviewing anyone he could find who had seen heard or been healed by Jesus. Thirdly, Luke carefully investigated, verse 3. 
the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions has published a diagram for its members on how to spot fake news. News outlets now have reality check web pages and Twitter accounts claiming to cut through the fake news so that we, the public, can know the truth. I love reading history. Had I not trained as a scientist, I'd probably have become a historian. And it's shocking how some people blatantly and so often obviously write articles, books and blogs with little regard for historical accuracy. But none of that for Dr. Luke. Luke carefully checked everything out. He says in verse 3, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. The Apostle Paul, with whom Luke travelled, was in prison in Caesarea, up in the north of Palestine, for over two years. So during that time, what was Luke doing? Topping up his tan down on the beach in Caesarea? I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that this was one of the main times when Luke was interviewing those who had known Jesus. He was investigating. He was writing. Fourthly, and obviously perhaps, Luke himself actually wrote down what he discovered, verse 3. It seems to me that if the creator of the universe is going to go to such great lengths to reveal himself to us through coming to earth as a human, he's going to die for us so that we can be saved from the just penalty for our sins, he's going to call us to respond to that with our lives, he's going to want us to know about it today, 2,000 years later. These Bible writers were, as Peter puts it in his first letter, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they were writing. And God has ensured that we have these writings here today in the New Testament. And the fifth thing, there is a faith-building purpose to what Luke is doing. The Bible is given to us for a purpose. Luke says in verse 4 that he is writing this orderly account so that Theophilus, and by implication us also, may know the certainty of the things we've been taught, so that our faith, or trust in God's word, may be strengthened. The object of reading the Bible isn't just to fill our heads with knowledge, we feed on God's word so that we may grow in faith and in our relationship with him. So before we go on, are we taking God at his word? I mean, really taking God at his word in the easier seasons of life and in the more testing times, like for many people just now. Does God's word here in the Bible merely inform our lives or does it direct our lives? There's a big difference. The book of Acts is Luke's second book and it's really the continuation of his gospel account. Many movie sequels are nowhere near as good as the first movie. Remember Home Alone 2, Grease 2, Sister Act 2, or maybe you want to forget them. But Luke's Book of Acts is just as awesome as Luke's Gospel. And it's not fiction, it's history. Next Sunday, we'll be starting a new Sunday Bible teaching series in the Book of Acts. 
Acts tells us about the early church, how it started in Jerusalem with the death and resurrection of Jesus, how the Holy Spirit was given to all Christians to open our eyes to his word and to empower us to live for him in this world. And Acts tells us how the church grew and grew despite opposition, so that by the end of the book of Acts, we hear how the gospel is being preached in Rome, the epicentre of the Roman Empire, and how people there were becoming Christians. Stay with us as we begin this exciting and inspiring journey, as we follow in the footsteps of Peter, Paul, Luke and others. And as we see how the risen Christ redeemed lives and families and whole communities then, just as he does today. A time of confession. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
a time of intercession. Father, we thank you that you created all things by speaking them into existence. We thank you that your voice sustains the universe. We thank you that one day Jesus will return to take us, his people, home to be with you in paradise. And we thank you that now in this broken, rebellious world, you hear our prayers and answer us in your perfect timing. May our prayers more completely fit with your plans and purposes. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, we can forget that millions are suffering in other ways. This day, Lord, we pray for the people of East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula and Southwest Asia, facing the spring locust swarms and the loss of crops and food shortages that follow. We pray especially for the people of Yemen, facing what Tear Fund and Save the Children describe as the world's biggest humanitarian crisis. People there are in urgent need of safe water, food and sanitation. They face cholera, diphtheria and many other diseases and now coronavirus is just getting a hold there. We pray for Christians in Yemen who are being routinely persecuted and murdered. Please sustain Christ followers in that land and give them renewed hope and joy in the midst of their suffering. And may their witness to others be powerful and life-changing. Please, Lord, turn Yemen right around in every way in which this unstable country is currently broken and rebelling against you. Father, we pray for those known to us who are suffering from COVID-19 just now, for those who are anxious and those who mourn. We take a moment in silence to bring before you those especially on our hearts this day. Gracious God, we hold before you those on our hearts and pray that you would meet them where they are and bring them healing, love and fresh hope in Christ. Father, we thank you that in Christ is to be found the greatest healing. We pray that across the UK there would be a great awakening to your existence and to the wonder of the glorious gospel of Christ. Lord, have mercy and bring new life. May our church families at Lostock and Dean stay faithful to your word and stay prayerful And in our personal and public lives, may we bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the risen Christ grant us the joys of eternal life with him. Amen.